Good evening. Trust your week is going well. We're here now on Wednesday night and building on the uh, message, uh, of course, building on the protection in perilous times theme that has been on my heart for a couple of weeks now, obviously because of the perilous times that we are in. And from what uh, <clears throat> Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.1, that in the last days perilous times would come. So that's kind of been my, my theme and my approach to it. Uh, the last two sessions, uh, good, on Friday, Good Friday, and on Monday, uh, I was speaking about the importance of us considering God. The Bible tells us that we need to con consider God and what he might be doing. You know, people are giving their opinions on where this came from and where this uh, virus come from. Did it come from China? Did it come from here? Did it come from there? And, you know, to some degree... It, uh, I, mean, I mean, from a medical standpoint and from a scientific standpoint, I'm sure it's significant as to where it came from as they try to find a vac make a vaccine or find an answer to it. But from the standpoint of, 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 of God, uh, it doesn't make any difference where it came from. The, the fact of the hand is that it's here. And uh, what is God's hand in this? Uh, as I began a, a couple sessions ago talking about uh, you know, is, is this the judgment of God? Is God involved in judging? And so the last couple uh, sessions I've taken a look at <clears throat> very briefly, of course, you know, in a half an hour and in two half hour sessions, uh, it, it, you can only do so much, but just to kind of address a little bit about God being the judge of all the earth, the righteous judge of all the earth and how we see in scripture, God, God's hand of judgment time and time and time again. And, and then Monday I, I, I talked about how uh, you know, the, the, how, how the different judgments, uh, the different uh, uh, reasons why God brings judgment. And we talked about original sin and we talked about, uh, you know, rejection. We talked about uh, disobedience, how those, you know, right from scripture themselves will, will result in judgment. I mean, they do in life itself. Uh, if you reject your boss's counsel, you know, you're probably going to get judged by losing your job. If you're disobedient to, you know, to, to, to the people you work for or whatever, there's, there's going to be a, a price to pay, so to speak. <clears throat> and then the last one we looked for at was, of course, uh, correction or judgment for the sake of, why, of perfecting us. In other words, God's not judging me because of something that I did wrong. He's not bringing correction because I've, 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 I've not done what's right, but he's saying you can do better. There's more that can be done. There's the, the potential within you uh, is, is fabulous. And so therefore, if you'll, if you'll bite the bullet and if you'll you know, batten down the hatches and if you'll press in, that there's a place that we can attain to that will be so much more fruitful than where we were before. So that's what we talked about leading up to this. A session tonight. And what I want to talk about now is, okay, go from considering God, but in light of our consideration of God and what God might be doing in the earth right now, now I need to consider myself. I need to consider, uh, maybe I need to consider my opinions. Maybe I need to consider my conclusions that I've, I've drawn. Maybe I need to consider my perspect perspective of God. I, I want to start by reading uh, out of Haggai chapter one, uh, verses five, uh, uh, through seven, I'm sorry, verses four through seven. And it says this, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. It was back at a time when the temple uh, was not being taken care of. And you know, I, I shared a few weeks ago how the New Testament temple, God's temple today is not a building made with men's hands. God's temple is not the temple in Jerusalem that people want to talk about it being rebuilt and so on. Clearly from scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, uh, God says our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when he says, uh, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? We need to consider that, uh, you know, the Bible also goes on and says that I belong to the Lord. If I'm a believer today, I no longer belong to myself. I traded my ownership of myself uh, because he purchased me with his blood. Not only have my sins been forgiven because of his blood, not only do I have the gift of eternal life but because of his blood, but I also gave my life over to him. And so uh, the Bible says uh, that my life belongs to the Lord, that, that I'm not my own master anymore. Uh, that he is. And so therefore, when we talk about the temple lying in ruins, it's really speaking about if, if, if me as a believer, as a Christian, 
am not walking in the spirit. I'm not walking in obedience to God. I'm not fulfilling the call of God upon my life. Uh, then I need to look and say, whoa, what's going on here? The Lord's response to it uh, in, in Haggai's day was consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're filled, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. You know, you might look at your life and say, you know what? I work my, my tail to the bone. Uh, I've done so much uh, to get this job. And I put so much into my education and whatever it might be. But you're at a point in your life right now, whether it's because of the circumstances that are going on, all of a sudden people that, who's, who had job security don't even have jobs anymore today and aren't even guaranteed that their job's going to exist when it comes time to come back out of this again. There, there's just a lot of shaking that's going on. And you might even be looking at what's happening, not so much in light of your fear of the coronavirus, but your concern about the impact that this is going to have on society uh, in, the, in the years to come, maybe for the, re for, for the rest of time uh, as we know it. And so therefore, uh, the Lord is saying, maybe you're at a point where you feel like you've done all this, but it's all going to pot. It's all going to nothing. Uh, or you're concerned that it might be. I'm not convinced that things are going to be as bad uh, and not come back in a, in a level of strength that's going to be a blessing to many. But he says this, what you need to do is consider your ways. So even today, if you have job security, even today, if you're, you know, the way the government's working on financial provision and so on, there's probably going to be some people that come out of this in the end, there will be people that the, the sickness did not touch their home or their family. Uh, they didn't lose their job. Uh, they went on unemployment and they ended up making more money than if they were employed for five weeks. There will be those that come out of it and that will kind of be their testimony that, uh, uh, you know, hey, it wasn't all that bad. But God is saying this, you still need to consider your ways because this is not the end of the situation. This is what... Uh, um, uh, Matthew 24, 8 says, is the beginning of sorrows. There are going to be other times and other things that are going to come in the process of time that what we do now, how I consider my ways now, my response to this is going to prepare me for how I'm going to do when that comes later on. And so I want to talk about the importance for us to examine ourselves. Uh, I want to give you four things that it's important during this time that you examine. The first one is, is to examine your motives. What is the reason behind your life? What is the reason that you do the things that you do? What is the reason that you prioritize the things that you prioritize? What is, what, 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 why is it? Psalm 26, 2 says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. So it's really important, and I, I've said over the last few weeks, the way that we test ourselves is with the word of God. And so how do I know where my heart is at? How do I know my motives are proper? How do I know my, my, my priorities are right? Well, you need to test your mind, your thoughts, your intentions, your desires, uh, and your heart um, to the Word of God. And so to, the way to examine your motives is by examining reading the Bible. You need to read the Bible every day. You need to read through the Word every day. And as you read things that, that expose wrong thinking in your life, as you read things that expose wrong priorities in your life, now I'm examining and I'm finding out that on number one, I got that wrong. The, 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 the answer key is telling me that number one was the answer, not number three. So I need to go back and read the answer to that and look at number three so that next time when I'm tested on the big test, I got the right answer set in my mind, not the one that I thought it was. Well, we need to do the same thing with our life. We need to examine our lives and we need to take a look and see in light of God's hand, in light of what I've learned about God being the righteous judge of all the earth, in light of realizing that there's a very good chance that through what's happening in this day and this hour, God is judging something. God is deeming something uh, to not be correct, to not be right in the land, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the world, let alone maybe in my life. I can't answer for the world. I, I can't even answer for America, but I can answer for myself. And so I need to take a look and see if there's changes that God wants to bring in my life as I examine my motives. The second one is, is examine your works. So this isn't so much the reason behind your life, but it's the, what actions are resulting from those inner motivations. 
You know, it's our works. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Uh, James said, I can show you my faith by my works. So sometimes we need to take a look at our actions and, and see if our actions line up with the word of God. Not just the way I think, not just the way I feel, but are my actions the things that are a priority in my life? Even how I approach work, how I approach my relationship with my wife and children, how I approach my relationship with my neighbors. Uh, what is my commitment? If I'm a believer today, what is my commitment to the church? What's my commitment? to the body of Christ. These are all things we need to look at. Galatians 6, 4 says this, but let each one examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. So we need to not only examine our mind and our hearts, our thoughts and our desires, but we need to examine our works. The third thing is, is we need to examine our faith. It says in 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 5, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? If you're truly a Christian and truly a believer today and have truly been born again, then Jesus Christ dwells in you by the person of the Holy Spirit. It is the, it is the Spirit of God that dwells within you. And if the Spirit of God dwells within you, you know that. If you're here today listening and saying, well, I, I think I prayed that prayer one time, but I'm not sure if it worked or if it didn't work. Well, let me tell you something. If that's where you are today, then it didn't work, okay? And it didn't, didn't not work because of God, but it didn't work because maybe you didn't understand at the time. Maybe you, you know, thought just a quick prayer was all it took to change your life and didn't realize that there's a life of obedience. There needs to be a renewing of the mind. There needs to be a repentance in life and so on that needs to take place. And so uh, you're, do you really, it's not, do I have faith? You know, a lot of people have faith in, I have faith in my job. I have faith in the government. I have faith in, this is, do you have faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you, do you have enough faith that you have repented? You've asked for forgiveness. You've given your life to him. You've confessed your sins. And so therefore you are in the faith. It's not a matter of I have faith, I'm in the faith because you need to be in the faith at this point in time. There's a lot of people having a lot of conversations. I'm seeing it on, on Facebook and so on. I've had people even ask me about, they're, they're questioning their salvation and uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't question my salvation. I know I'm saved. Uh, you know, I don't know everything that God is doing and how he's doing it and everything I ought to be doing, but I do know that I'm saved. I have an assurance of my salvation. It's rock solid. It's 100% because I know what the Bible has to say about it, how it took place, and what do I need to do to keep walking in that. And those are the choices that I'm making each and every day of my life. Am I sinless? No. Am I perfect? No. Do I still make mistakes? Yes. But I know my salvation. I have an assurance of my salvation. And uh, I know whom in whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And so who or what are you trusting in for your salvation? You may, be, you may have gone to church your whole life. You may have gone to church for 50, 60 years, and yet you're questioning your salvation today. Your salvation is not based upon that you go to church, what church you go to, whether you're a deacon or whether you're on the board or how much money you put in the offering basket. It's not based on that. It's based on have you put your trust in Jesus Christ and his shed blood as the propitiation or payment or ransom for your sin and you have become born again. <clears throat> You've asked God to send his Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of you. And while you know you're not perfect and your thoughts aren't always perfect and your desires aren't always perfect and your actions aren't always perfect, but you know that you're in love with God. And you know that you have got a, that you are trusting in him for your eternal, uh, uh, your eternal salvation. And so you need to take a look. And 2 Corinthians 13, 5, again, it says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. You know what? What's, what we're going through right now is a test of our faith. God is testing our faith. And he says in his word that the testing of our faith is precious. There's a preciousness about testing something because when you test it, we're not testing it uh, <clears throat> to see if we have any, although in some people's lives, this test is exposing their lack of faith totally. In other place, people, it's not, it's not, they're not uh, concluding that they have no faith, but they realize that they need to increase in their faith. The Bible says that our faith needs to be increased. The Bible says that we ha can ha uh, not have just a, a measure of faith, but we can have great faith. 
And so God is saying here, examine as to whether you are in the faith. Maybe you need to talk to somebody. Maybe you need to sit down and say, you know what? I, I, I thought I was a Christian or I felt like I was, but I'm just, I, I want to make sure. Sit down with a, a, a true believer. Sit down with a pastor sometime. I mean, my wife Penny and I were available. If, if you ever want to have a conversation and you're within striking range of Alfred or, or you want to text or email or, or FaceTime or whatever it is, we would be happy to talk with you about what the Bible specifically says, or, or, or I have manuals and, and, and books and tracts and things that we could send to you to make sure that you have that assurance of salvation. So we've got, how do I, what do I need to examine? I need to examine, number one, my motives. Number two, I need to examine my works. Number three, I need to examine my faith, if I'm in the faith. And number four, I need to examine my walk. My walk is my relationship within the household of faith. So it differs from works. Works are the things that I do. My walk is how I am affecting the people around me, how I am how I'm in contact with the people. And I'm not talking now just about your neighbor. That's part of your, your work, you know, as we, as we share with our neighbors and we help them in times of need. Your walk is that, can two walk together, Amos 3.3 3 said, unless they be agreed, and the answer is no. So when the Lord is talking about a, our walk, he's talking about us walking together, A, with him, and walking together with the body of Christ? How is my relationship with the body of Christ? There are some people today that would say, well, I'm a Christian. I just don't go to church. Well, that's not a good thing, okay? It's not about going to church. It's about the church is your family. Uh, I know we all have family members uh, that maybe aren't our favorite family members. Uh, maybe you've got an uncle or somebody, a distant cousin that, you know, has done things that has become offensive to you or whatever it might be. But nonetheless, they're still your family. And so, you know, if we have unforgiveness toward our family, then that's going to lead to bitterness. It's going to lead to all kinds of problems that we have. So we need to know that we need to be walking in covenant relationship with the house of faith. That primary place is going to be my local church. That those primary people are going to be the believers that are in the house that I have planted myself in. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. It's not just saying, well, I'm part of the church universal, which is true if you're a believer, but where are you planted, okay? The, wherever something is planted, it's a geographical location, and that's where they are. That's where they'll draw their nutrition. That's where they'll draw their nutrients out of the soil. That's the place that, you know, the, that's the a greenhouse is the climate of a greenhouse is established for the very purpose of the specific things that are planted in it. And so God has a greenhouse. He has a church for you to be planted in, not to be bopping around to different ones all the time. You take a plant and, you know, in and out and I take it here and I take it there and I'm always moving it around and I'm, I'm leaving it in the pot that it came in. It's going to stifle the growth. It's going to keep it from being able to produce what it could. Uh, uh, we had an orange tree here at one time. We had an orange seed, planted the orange seed, grew into an orange tree, and eventually it, it, it produced little oranges, but it was in a pot, and those little sour oranges never got to be big oranges and never got to be really sweet uh, because it was in a, in a, it, it was the environment that it needed to grow in as far as the, the temperature, uh, but the pot was limited. If we went out and planted it outside where it had all kinds of ground space, the uh, environment outside would have killed it. And so it was just, it was limited, and we can be limited ourselves uh, by not uh, <clears throat> not being planted in God's house where we can flourish in the courts of our God. And so your walk is your relationship with the household of faith. Let me share this with you real quick. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26 through 29. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. It's talking here about how we relate to the Lord's body. It's not, the cup here and the bread is actually talking about taking communion. When we take communion, we also call it the Lord's table sometimes or the Lord's supper. And this section of scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 tells us that when we come together, because communion is not something you take by yourself. The very term communion is about coming together with someone else. Two people, I believe, can share communion together. Jesus becomes the th third fold, fold cord, uh, according to Ecclesiastes uh, uh, 4. But at the same time... Uh, 
it's really intended to take with people. Jesus sat down and had the Lord's Supper or the Passover meal. If you read in scripture, uh, he had it with his disciples. There were 12 of them gathered together. And so this is talking about when you do that, when you take communion together, it's not about eating food or drinking wine or having bread. It's about coming together as the household of faith and, uh, and, and, and examining myself. You know, do I have an attitude toward my brother over there? Have I, not, uh, have I offended this person over here? Uh, it's, it's about looking into our life. It's about examining ourselves. And before we take communion, because the bread and the, and the, and the, and the juice... The, the, the bread and the wine are symbolic of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, the body being broken for us, his blood being shed for us. Uh, when we come, we're, we're kind of renewing our vows. We're renewing our vows with God, but we're also renewing our vows with one another. It said right here in that verse, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The Bible calls the church the body of Christ. I'm part of the body. You look in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about we're all parts of the body of Christ. Well, the, the one, the, the eye can't say to the, to the foot that I have no need of you and so on. We're all a piece of the body. We are not alone the body. Alone I'm a believer. Alone I'm a Christian. Alone I'm a child of God. But I'm supposed to be part of the body of Christ too. I'm part of the household of faith, the family of God. And so therefore, as part of the body, I need the rest of the body. You may be weak today because you don't, you're not part of the body of Christ. You may be struggling with understanding about God today because you've not been sitting yourself in a place where you've been taught the word of God. These things are very significant. It's one of the reasons why I'm putting out these teachings because I can't meet with the body of Christ. I can't be together. I can send texts. I can send emails. But what this is allowing me to do is to share messages so that we can connect and have fellowship together. Out of that, people are contacting me. Pastor, that was a good word the other day. What did you mean by this or that? And we're doing our best to maintain covenant relationship as the body while we are trying to be obedient uh, to the governing uh, 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 the, the ministry of the government according to Romans 13 and do what has been presented to us as guidelines of social distancing. And so with the technology that we have today, we can do both of those. But he's saying here, you do need to examine your walk and your relationship with the household of faith. What is your, maybe out of this time, maybe you've not been going to church for a while. Maybe someone offended you. Maybe something happened that caused you to leave a church and say, you know what? I don't have a problem with God, but I got a problem with Christians. Whatever it is, I've heard all of those things, but that you will choose to get back involved again. You'll choose to get back planted again. You'll get to choose to get back where you'll have, uh, you know, everybody might not be the favorite person that you hang out with, but I'll tell you what, our entire church, and I love our church and the people that have come through our church and come uh, from other places and come for different seasons, they've all had a positive impact on me, even if it came through negative circumstances. Uh, we've had people that have been in our church that aren't in our church anymore. Uh, I may have offended them. Whatever happened, they left, they went someplace else. But I still look at those times as positive times that God used, even if we had conflict, to, to mold me into the person that I am today. So I just want to encourage you to examine yourself also concerning your walk with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I look, I have examined my motives, I examine my works, I examine wh whether I'm in the faith, I examine my walk, and I'll dare tell you that every time I examine myself, there's something there that God shows me that needs to be adjusted, something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be addressed. And uh, going back to where we finished the last session on Sunday, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday, I've talked about uh, that verse in Revelations 2, uh, I read 1 through 5, but verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, verse 5, from whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works. And so, as I consider myself, the next thing that comes back to me is I need to, I need to, I need to ch make changes. I need to change the things that I'm re realizing are not up to snuff. They're not up to par with where I should be with God, whether it be my heart, whether it be my mind, my thoughts, whether it be my works, whether it be my faith, or whether it is my relationship with the body of Christ. And so I need to, at that point, I need to change my ways. You know, over here again, it said uh, in Revelation, remember from where you've fallen, repent and go back and do your first works. I want to close with this scripture in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. It says this, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. 
Let me read that again. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. As you search your heart, as you examine your ways, and as God puts his finger on anything, no matter how large or no matter how small, know this, that his grace is sufficient for you, that he is made strong in our weakness. Paul said, I discovered that when I am weak, then I am strong because it's in my weakness that I call upon the name of the Lord and he's right there to bring his supernatural divine strength into my life. So I want to encourage you to set your heart to seek the Lord, pray, spend some time with the Lord. Certainly, if you want to get a hold of me for anything, uh, whether it be any comments, whether it be any suggestions, uh, you can get a hold of me here at PastorRogerLCF at gmail.com. I trust uh, this whole series of uh, protection in perilous times as we're sharing from treasures of truth from God's word have been a blessing to you and will continue to. We're going to keep doing this uh, until we get back uh, to where we can meet some more uh, together. And then to be honest with you, I feel the Lord called us to invest in a, a level of quality of equipment that we're using that we are going to just continue to be able to live stream and, and produce quality videos uh, even in the future of things that we do so they can be more available to people who might not be here in Alfred or might not be able to exa access us in a, in a more physical way. And so that's our plan, but you can get a hold of me there if you want to. Let me know your thoughts. Again, your, your opinions, any questions you might have. Otherwise, uh, I'll be moving Friday into another aspect of protection in perilous times. Uh, be honest with you, uh, right now I'm just praying about what that aspect will be. So we'll hear that when we get to it. But for now, I just want to close in prayer and uh, say God bless you in Jesus' name. So let's just pray together here. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray right now that you, Lord, would uh, fill our hearts with your presence and with your spirit, Lord. I ask, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that, Lord, you would cause us to consider you and to consider our ways in light of our consideration of you. Lord, that this would be a season that many would turn their hearts to you. Many would repent. Many would make changes in their life. Many would confess their condition. Many would grant forgiveness where bitterness has been and unforgiveness has been. Lord, whatever it is, Lord God, that you would do such a work in the, first of all, in your, in your church, Lord God. You said, actually, you said in your word that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Lord, you're, first of all, you're working on your church. You're working on your children, Lord God. Uh, and then, Lord, from there, that what happens in our life Lord God, would carry over and would touch a lost and dying world. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to the end of pleasing our God and being, Lord, the sons and daughters that you have called us to be, embracing your grace, embracing your mercy, and embracing your calling upon our lives. And so, Father, thank you again for this time together. May your word, not one word, fall to the ground, but may it have its perfect work. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.